the Torah says like this, you know, the brothers come down and Yosef is, uh, Yosef is incognito. They don't know, they don't know who he is. And, uh, and uh, Yosef is, uh, 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 tells them that they have to go home and they have to bring down Binyamin in order to uh, confirm who they are. That's, what, that's where we were holding last. That, that, that's where the Torah is holding it at the end of this week's Parsha. So the Torah begins at page 250, Parsha's Vayigash. So it says like this, Vayigash love Yehuda. Now Yehuda has taken responsibility. Yehuda said to Yaakov, you know, I'll take responsibility, and I'm going to bring Binyamin home. you got to let me take him down because, because otherwise we're going to starve. If we don't have food, i got to go. So Yehuda takes responsibility for Binyamin, and Yosef manages to... Uh, create a, uh, a a bum wrap by putting his his uh, gvia the, the the fancy cup in Binyamin's uh, uh, in Binyamin's bag. So Binyamin finds this cup, and everybody now they got to go back to Mitzrayim. This is where they're holding. And Yosef sends last week's parsha by saying, "All right, I'll keep him slave, and the rest of you go home." At that point, Yehuda's had about enough. So it says, Vayigash Elov Yehuda, Yehuda approaches him, Vayomer bi Adoni, listen my master, Yedaber na avlecha dover beozne Adoni. Let me say something in your, in your ears, literally in your ears, uh, that's what it means. So he says, let me say something to you privately. Vayichar apcha beavdecha, don't get angry, kichamocha kichfaro, because I see you as I see Paro. The implication is, if you give me a hard time, I'll kill you and I'll kill Paro, your master. That's what Raji says. Yehuda is already, you know, he's had about enough. And this is the proverbial with all due respect. You know, and he says, please don't get angry, and I'd like to say something, which is like when you say to somebody with all due respect, which means if anybody ever says that to you, gentlemen, that just means you're about to get insulted. Right? With all due respect means somebody's about to tell you why it is that you're incompetent, but don't get, don't get it with all due respect. So he says, look, you know, Yoda, Yoda's upset. And then he goes, starts telling him the whole, the whole story over here. Now, why is it that at this point, it, why is it that at this point Yehuda is convinced that the, it, up until now the brothers kept saying, listen, it's our fault, we sold him, he pleaded, he, uh, we didn't pay attention to his pleading. And all of a sudden Yehuda changes his tune now and says, okay, enough is enough. I mean, if it's a divine punishment, if it's a divine punishment, which the brothers had seen it all along, so then why are you saying enough is enough? Something changed over here that convinces Yehuda that this is not a divine punishment, that this is some sort of, what's it called when you, uh, when you, when you not entrapping, when you, uh, when you frame someone. There's a frame up over here. And Yehuda says this is a frame up, this is not, in halacha you could only entrap somebody when it comes to uh, idol worship, you're allowed to actually entrap somebody. If somebody is, an, is inciting other people to worship idols, then you're allowed to take to entrapment. In other words, if somebody comes over to me and says, hey, let's go worship idols. So what I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to put two, hide two witnesses. The, the mission says you put two witnesses behind the wall. Then you say to the guy, uh, tell me, what, what was it you want to do? And the guy says, well, there's a great idol. You know, guy, you know there's a real hot idol over here. You know, uh, why don't you come over, let's go worship together. And at that point, they could, they could take the guy to Bayesden and, and nail him, for, nail him for, for idol worship. There you're allowed to entrap because the guy who's the, he's the pusher, he's the dealer, the dealer is always worse than the user. And this is a guy who's, who's inciting other people to idol worship, which is the worst sin. So uh, 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 the Torah says that their, their entrapment is allowed. Now, here we're not talking about entrapment as much as a frame-up. So Yehuda is suspected. Why? What changed? What changed all of a sudden from Yehuda thinking that it's a divine punishment to a frame-up? This Egyptian, this Egyptian ruler, whoever he is, is making trouble for us. What changed in this story? So the answer is like this. Up until now, the brothers were the ones who were in trouble. Now they bring, we're page 250. Now they bring Binyamin down to Egypt, and all of a sudden Binyamin gets nailed with this goblet business, that he stole the goblet. And uh, uh, um, what Yehuda realizes is, Binyamin was the only one of the brothers who was not involved in the sale. It can't be a divine punishment for Binyamin because he was never involved in the sale to begin with. Not only that, the Gemara says, there are four people who never sinned. One of them is Binyamin. So the brothers know, he, I mean, he's, you know, if the Gemara knows it, the brothers certainly knew it. You know, <laughs> There's no way he did anything wrong over here. At that point, Yudas says, okay, this whole thing's a frame-up. This whole thing's a frame-up over here. Enough is enough. And that's why Yehuda approaches over Now, what we're going to see is a very interesting future connection. Because Yehuda has this bond with Binyamin and he goes to bat for him, so what are we going to see later on in history? Where's the base Amigdash built? 
Because we're going to build a Binyamin's portion, but yeah. part of it goes into Yehuda. Binyamin and Yehuda are neighbors in Eretz Yisrael. They're right and they're right, and they're, they're neighbors territorially. Binyamin and Yehuda become neighbors as tribes. And even more, when there's a big split, the ten tribes go off to the they, and create one kingdom. The Malchus Yisrael is the, the, the ten tribes, and the two tribes is what's called Malchus Yehuda, which David Amalek ruled over. And Malchus Yehuda is the two tribes of Yehuda and Binyamin. So there's a band here that's created between Yehuda and Binyamin, which is a band that's going to extend. It's going to extend through history because of Yehuda going to bat for Binyamin over here. Approaching Yosef, because Yehuda, no, because he took responsibility. He took responsibility. He said to Yaakov Avinu, "Look, first Ruvain said to Yaakov Avinu, I'll take Binyamin.' And Yehuda Yaakov says, "No, no, don't I? I you know, no, maybe not." And and uh, then Yehuda steps forward. He says, "Look, Dad, if we stay here, we're going to die anyway because there's no food. Now we got to go. Give me the kid. Give me Binyamin. I'll take him down." And you'll take him from me. And if I don't, if I don't bring him back to you and put him right in front of you, then I will have sinned to you for eternity, eternally. And I'm taking him, but we're going to have to do this. So Yaakov sees in Yehuda, who is the king. Remember, Yehuda is the, where, the, where, where the royalty comes from. Yehuda is the king. Yaakov sees in Yehuda is the one he could trust, and Yehuda is going to go down there, and he's going, and he takes responsibility. That's why he, that's why he comes to uh, to uh, uh, Yosef. Now it's very interesting. The Gemara says like this. There's an interesting piece of Gemara. The Gemara says there was a Roman emperor who once called in his wise men. And he said to his wise men, uh, listen, if a guy has a sore on his foot, should you suffer with the sore, or should you cut it off and be relieved? Which was an allusion to the Jewish people. He was an anti-Semite, and he said, listen, these guys bug me. Should I, should I, st- should I suffer with the Jewish people, or should I, should I cut them off? So everybody said, cut them off. So there's a man named Ketia Bar Shalom, who was one of the Roman advisors, and he says to the king, well, excellently, uh, uh, there are two problems here. Problem number one is uh, just a pra- you know, practical problem uh, that uh, y- you know, you're not going to be able to cut them off because the Jews are all over the world, and you're never going to be able to get all of them. So you're not practical implication isn't going isn't to work. You just can't do it. And number two, even if you did succeed, then people say, well, you're an empire that's actually a lacking empire. You are a second-rate empire because you're lacking a nation. Most kings say, you're an emperor over all these nations. Now you're missing one nation, so it's not just not good for you to do it. So the king says, well, you've spoken wisely, but uh, you know, anybody, we have a rule here. Anybody who gets the better of the king in an argument gets thrown into a flaming furnace. And, uh, in, in life, don't be right, be smart type of thing. So, so he says, you get thrown into a flaming furnace. So on the way to the uh, being taken out to execute it, somebody said, to, oh, a Roman noblewoman said, well, it's a shame that you're going to die for the Jewish people without joining them. So he immediately circumcised himself. The Gemara says he circumcised himself so he could die as a Jew. And then they, and that's why he's called Ketia Bar Shalom, and they threw him, into the, threw him into the flaming furnace. And then a heavenly voice came out and said, Ketia Bar Shalom has immediate passage into paradise. And then Rabbi Yudha Nasi, who heard the heavenly voice, Rabbi Yudha Nasi cried, and he said, there are certain people who takes a lifetime for them to acquire their portion, and some people acquire their portion in a moment. In one moment, one instant, they acquire their eternity. So uh, the lesson over there is that, you know, if you speak in front of a king, better be pretty discreet, because kings don't like to be anybody to make them look bad in public. That's why the Torah says, Yehuda says, I, let me speak in your ears, meaning private private just between me and you, because Yehuda understands, even if he says the right thing over here, an emperor may be very sensitive. You, you may be right, but an emperor doesn't want to look bad. And therefore Yehuda says, let me, let me say it to you privately, so that if I'm right, you won't throw me into a flaming furnace. By the way, uh, uh, one of the, you know, there's a famous question. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, when he heard the heavenly voice on Ketia Bar Shalom, he cried. He, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi cried. He said, some people acquire their eternity in a lifetime, some people acquire it in an instant. So why is he crying? You should be happy for the guy. What's Rabbi Anasi crying for? I heard, I heard Rabbi Beryl Wine once said, you know why he's crying? He's crying for all those wasted moments. If you could acquire your, if you could acquire your, your, your eternity in a moment, so, you know, why take a lifetime? You know, look, and a lifetime is made up of a series of moments. Use each moment. Use each moment. We see how powerful a moment could be. Right, so the Gemara says, the Gemara says that he, okay, so that's why Yehuda goes in and, and he, uh, and, and he, uh, and he says it. Now, 
Uh, one of the commentaries here points out, completely out of context, Vayigash Elov Yehuda. Yehuda approaches him. Who is the him in the life of a Jew? Right? It's Hashem. Vayigash Elov, you approach him, Yehuda. The Jew approaches. The Jew approaches God. How do we approach God? Amidah. Huh? Amidah. Amidah. What does the word Yehuda come from? Where the name Yehuda, when Leah named him, how did she name him? What was the point of the Hoduk, which comes from Thanksgiving? You want to thank God. The way a Jew approaches God is by thanking God. Our approach, our attitude with God has to be we are grateful to whatever God gives us. That's what the Svasama says. We're grateful for anything that God gives us. Always approach. When you're grateful to somebody, when, you're, when, you're, when you have a debt of gratitude to somebody, it humbles you. It always humbles you when you have to thank somebody for something. That's why people don't like, people like to pay you back because they don't want to be indebted to you. They don't want to be ingratiated to you. So, the attitude of a Jew is we are indebted to God. And since when one is indebted, one is contrite. Our whole attitude is to be an attitude. That's really what Hanukkah is. Hanukkah is a holiday of, of thanking God for the miracles that he's done for us. That's what the Torah is alluding to. Now, uh, it, so he goes and he tells him this whole story. And uh, Yosef's melting slowly but surely as he tells him the story about how our father wouldn't handle it if he comes home and he'll die and he can't take the shock. And, and remember, it's Yosef, so I, and they don't know that it's Yosef yet. Now Yosef, one of the most emotional and uh, um, um, uh, uh, very poignant lessons that we find in the Torah. Take a look at page 252. What's Yosef? The truth of the matter is like this. Let's back up. Just a, a general question. Why did Yosef go through this whole charade? And an even a bigger question, even a bigger question. Why didn't Yosef ever send the message to Yaakov? He's been away 22 years. Why didn't he ever send the message to Yaakov that he's alive? Why do why, why he's been away from home 22 years? He's the king. He could easily have sent the message out. Well, it could be when he was in prison, not. But when you're the king. You could send the message, send the message to Yaakov that you're alive. Why are you letting him stew there for 22 years? Why don't you send the message? And why is he going through the whole charade over here? You go through the charade and send them back and forth. What do you say, Isha? He doesn't know how he's going to fulfill this prophecy. Maybe. Okay, the prophecy has to be fulfilled. But okay, hey, you know, you, uh, I have to fulfill a prophecy. But honoring your father is more important. Honoring your father is a mitzvah. It's a del raisa. Prophecies. Let God worry about prophecies. God gave you the prophecy. He'll fulfill the prophecy for you. Your job. Your job is to take care of your father. You have a mitzvah to say Doraisa, a Torah command, not to let your father stew in his in his grief over there. In 22 years, you're letting your father stew in the grief. Why? The answer is Yosef was concerned. The commentary said Yosef he's going to send a message to his father he's alive. Maybe the brothers are going to come and hunt him. He doesn't know where the brothers are holding. Maybe the brothers will come and hunt him down and kill him this time. They'll do the job properly. They'll get him at Yaakov, get him as hey boys, Yosef's alive in Egypt. And they'll come down to Egypt and they'll knock him off. Why, why, you know, you know, Yosef doesn't know where the brothers are holding, and that's why this entire, this entire sequence over here, he needs to know, have the brothers regretted what they've done? What's his proof going to be? The proof is when he takes the next best thing, which is Binyamin, is his, mother's bro his brother from his mother, his brother from his mother, that, his full brother, and the brothers are willing to go to bat for Binyamin, and they mention, they're showing that they're willing to go to bat for Binyamin. That is the proof to Yosef that had they had to do so for him, they would have not have done the same thing again. It's the proof to Yosef that the brothers have done tshuva. They regret what they've done. And at that point, Yosef's ready to, once he hears you, to say, listen, we are not leaving here without him. At that point, he says, okay, they've done tshuva. Now he could reveal himself. So take a look at take a look at the the, the at Pasuk Mem, Memhe, uh, page two fifty two, is seven lines from the top. Velo Yochel Yosef lehis apek lechol anitzavim alav. Yosef could not hold himself back. He's already you know he he can't take it anymore. Vayikra he cries out, Hotziu kol ish me aloi. Get everybody out of here. Velo Amar ish ito bizvara Yosef. Not one Egyptian was there when Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. So first of all, you can imagine the emotional trauma, the emotional strain on Yosef. This is Yosef, who was able to control himself with Mrs. Potiphar in a test that almost no one in history could possibly have passed. 
And yet, at this point, the Torah says Yosef couldn't control himself anymore. So you can imagine the pressure, the emotional pressure on Yosef at this point. If the same Yosef who could control himself with Mrs. Potiphar cannot, can't hold out another minute now, and what does Yosef do? First thing, get all the Egyptians out of here. Tremendous life lesson here. Tremendous life lesson. You know what the life lesson here is? Don't get emotional in front of Goyim. That's part, well, you could get emotional in front of Goyim. Uh, you know, it's not, not the end of the world, but... He's about to say something which is probably going to cause them embarrassment. It's going to be pretty embarrassing. You know, it's pretty embarrassing to say, hey, fellas, hi, Dave. Yeah, it's me who you sold 22 years ago. And everybody's sitting at the table just kind of staring at a spot on the table. You know, this is, now this is awkward. <laughs> yeah, you know, so everybody, everybody's kind of staring. I, I was once at a Shabbos table. It was a disaster, absolute disaster. Now, the wife started crying at the Shabbos table. The husband said, well, the chol, the, she put out, the truth is like this, they put out chalt. I didn't like it. I didn't want to go to anybody's house anyway. And I was sitting there. I was, wasn't married yet. And she put out the chalt. I just remember there's a word they used to use in the Westerns. When they would put out the, they would put out the food, they used to call it gruel. Right? That's what the chalt looked like. I mean, it really was unceremonious looking. And the husband, it was kind of this timid guy, and he just says to his wife, Wow, oh, wow, it looks so good. And his wife just started burst out in tears. It doesn't look so good. He said it looks so good. And his wife started to burst out. She says, but you haven't even tried it yet. And I don't know what their deal was. But, you know, I was, you know, and I was sitting there at the table with another guy, and there was a girl there also at the table. And we're just, I found the most enchanting spot on that table. <laughs> For 20 minutes, it was just, you know, it was just, uh, you know, and, and it was, it was, it was, you know. And I'm thinking, hey, people, get your act together over here, will you? You know, and so it was just absolutely embarrassing. You know, and you're sitting there like, this is awkward. <laughs> I had another guy, I had a yeshiva guy once from a different yeshiva. This guy's a real nut. So he said, he, he said, he, he once said, got up, he, he said, you know, uh, you got to be careful where you send guys for Shabbos. He said he was once at this newly married couple's house, and right, just the three of them, and right at the table, the husband and wife got into an argument. You know, the wife put out the gefilte fish, and the husband said something like, you know, why was the fish on a salt-free diet? And the wife said something like, well, only sweet people can taste salt. You know, something like that, and they were off to the races, and they sat, got in there, and they are actually yelling at each other right in front of him at the table, and then he says, and all of a sudden they lapsed into silence. The two of them just lapsed. And they're just sitting there for 10, 15 minutes, nobody's saying a word. And all of a sudden, this guy's a bit of a nut. And all of a sudden he does like this. <laughs> and so they look at him and they go, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm just, just cutting the tension. You know, <laughs> like that. And then she looks at, so he said, she's like saying, when you're married, you better not do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so sometimes there are just awkward moments. Now, this is going to be very, very awkward. So here's a man who's at the point that he can't control himself anymore, yet look where his head is at. Sensitivity. What about them? What about them? How are they going to feel if I just burst out? Oh, it's me, Yosef! So the first thing is get everybody out of here. Controls himself enough because of the concern, the sensitivity for the brothers, gets everybody out of the room. You know the famous story through Moshe Feinstein, who was once on the way to the yeshiva, and he got to the yeshiva, they, they got into a car, he drives to the yeshiva, when he gets to the yeshiva, he's holding, he's holding his, hand, his hand like this. So one of the bachim said, Rebbe, why are you holding your hand? And he was obviously in pain. He said, because the guy who closed the car door, he closed it on my finger. So he slammed the car door on my finger. So he says, yeah, but I didn't hear you yell. He goes, no, I didn't want to yell, because if I would have yelled, he would have felt bad that he crossed, closed the finger on my hand. So, you know, you know what kind of self-control that takes? But, but there's another person, there's a, human, there's a human being over here. You know, there's, a, there's a human being over here, you gotta be, you gotta be careful. I heard about a Rebbe and a Cheder, this is a beautiful story. The Rebbe and a Cheder, and uh, um, one of the kids stole money out of another kid's briefcase. So the Rebbe says, okay, I have no choice, I'm gonna have to search your pocket. He said, who took the money? Nobody would answer, I'm gonna have to search your pockets. So the kids are all like, they're like this. And the nurse says, okay, everybody stand up against the wall. He lines them up against the wall, their faces to the wall. He comes up behind them and reaches his hands into the pockets. And like the fourth or fifth kid, he finds the money. But after he finally him, he took the money, he hid it in his hand, and they went to each one of the kids and kept searching the pockets. So he said, then the kids turned around and said, okay, I found the money, here's your money back. And none of the kids knew who the kid was who he found the money in his pocket. Later in life, this kid had a struggle with his Yiddishkeit, 
and he started going off. And then one day he came back and he wrote a letter to this Rebbe. He said, I want you to know that I came back to Yiddishkeit because I had an incident in Cheder. I really couldn't have realized, how could I leave a religion where are sensitive people like you? And he, couldn't, and he came back, he wouldn't, he, he wouldn't leave it. So, so you have to know in life, even with your own children in the house, where parents you know, could lash out easily, you know, just because just this one's in trouble doesn't mean he's got to be, you don't have to put, make, make it a, 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 what do you call it, a, a, a entertainment for everybody else in the house. You, know, you have to be sensitive to other people. That's what Yosef, that's the first lesson here. So nobody's there when Yosef, shows, when Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. And then he goes like this, Vayitenes kolo bivchi. He starts crying. Vayishbu mitzrayim, vayishma beis paro. All of Egypt and all of Paro's house hear it. I don't think it means literally they heard it, but somebody reported, hey, you know, Yosef's crying over there. Okay? Now, I'm just skipping for a second. I'm just skipping for a second. Go, go to Pusuk 16. Go to Pusuk 16. Um... And on, the, on the next page, verse 16. He reveals himself and everything else happens. And then, and take a look at si page 16, the puzzle 16. It's right in the middle of the page. The Akol Nishma Beis Paro Labor, word got to Paro's house saying, Bo'u Ache Yosef, Yosef's brothers come, came. Ve'itav Bene Paro Uvene Avara. Paro and his servants were happy. Why should Paro and his servants be happy? hearing about the fact that Yosef's brothers came. So the answer is like this. The answer, you see, over here, all it says is Yosef started crying, and everybody heard about it in Egypt. Word got out real quick. Then when they found out that the reason he was crying was because it was his brothers, Paro and his, and his officials are happy. Why? The answer is, remember what was Yosef's function in Egypt? He's a finance minister. How do you think you'd, you're the president Who's the finance minister in America now? Bernanke, what's his name? Who's Bernanke? Bernanke, what's the name? Bernanke. Bernanke. The, what? The, 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 uh, Jack Lou just had a, a, an emotional breakdown in his office over here. He's crying hysterically. Now, if I was the President of the United States, I don't want to hear that about my Secretary of, Secretary of, uh, what do you call it? Secretary of, Tre of the Treasury is crying. <laughs> what disaster is upon us right now? And then a few seconds later, Parker says, well, no, no, it has nothing to do with this. He has a long, an emotional meeting. Oh, good. <laughs> much as Jack Lou's mother-in-law just left. You know, so he's, he's crying. Out, or she arrived. You know, he's crying tears. Out. You know, that's why he's crying. Oh, okay, that, that we can deal with. So, you know, first thing, you're, you're panicked. Who is this guy? What's he crying about? And then you find out later it's because his brother's right. And yeah, that's, that's the, right? So Yosef is crying. However, so Yosef is like, Yosef fell out now. Okay? So everybody hears about it. Now here is the, here is the Pasuk. Vayomer Yosef echel echov. Yosef says to his brothers, Ani Yosef. I am Yosef. Ha'oda v'chai, is my father still alive? Pasuk, back on page 252, Pasuk Gimel. Now listen to this Pasuk. This is, this, this one. This one, oh, we'll see in a second. This one really hurts. Vayomer Yosef Elechov. Yosef says to his brothers, Ani Yosef. I am Yosef. He reveals himself. Ha'oda Vichai, is my father still alive? First question, is my father still alive? He's asking, I mean, you've been telling me he is, but now tell me the truth. All along, you know, I don't know if you tell me the truth. Is my father still alive? Velo yochlu echov la'anoso, so his brothers could not answer. Ki nivhalu mipanov, they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. So, uh, you know, the Medrash over here says, Oi lanu miyom hadin. Oi lanu miyom hadin. The word oi is a Hebrew word. It's not just, it's not just a krechts that your zaidi used to make when he'd sit down on the couch. Oi, mine aching back. You know, oi is a really a Hebrew word. Oi lanu miyom hadin. Oi, there's a verse in Mishli that says, Lemi oi, lemi avoi. Who yells? You ever hear the expression oi vavoi? Oi vavoi really comes from oi and avoi, which are two words. The, med, the Pasuk in Mishli says, who groans oi? Who's constantly wailing avoi? And the verse continues, to people who tarry long at the cup. 
You know, people who are into drinking, you know, the next day they wake up, you know, bruised, battered, and aching. You know, me, oh, let me have, you know, as your roommate in college, or probably you, waking up the next morning, oh, you know, you know shh, quiet down, guys, will you? Nobody's making a sound. <laughs> Nobody said anything. Well, it sounds off. That's an awfully loud quiet over there. You know, let me, oh, let me avoid. That's the, that's the, the so, so I had a guy here told me he had, he had, he had a friend in college who was such a, such a beer drinker. He said everywhere the guy went, he had beer. He had beer in his car, beer in class, beer, everywhere he had beer. He says he woke up in the morning, he put beer in his Cheerios. You know, he was constantly drinking beer. You know, he was just drinking beer, 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 beer. So he says, let me, oh, so it's the Medrash says like this. Oy lanu miyom adin, woe to us from the day of judgment. Oy lanu miyom atochecha, woe to us on the day of rebuke. If Yosef's brothers, who are rebuked by a man of flesh and blood, had no response for him, so all the more so when we're, when we're rebuked by Kodesh Baruch Hu. That's what, that's what the Medrash says. The famous question on that Medrash is, well, that's true, and it's a great Kalvachomer, and it works, there's only one problem. There's only one problem. Where does Yosef rebuke his brothers? He never rebuked his brothers. All he did was he revealed himself. He didn't even rebuke him. I said, Hi, I'm Yosef, is my dad alive? Well, what would you ask if you, you, your father, who you're so connected to, where's any rebuke over here? So this is the one that hurts, gents. You know what Yosef was saying to the brother? You know what the rebuke was? Yehuda comes down and says to him, oh, we got to take the kid back home. His father will never survive the blow. You know, we're worried about, you know, how will he survive? He'll be shocked if Binyamin does. So Yosef says, I'm Yosef. Is my father still alive? Where was this concern 22 years ago when you sold me? All of a sudden you're telling me you're so concerned about your father? You're so concerned about your father? I'm Yosef. Is my father still alive? Where was that 22 years ago? Where was, where was that concern? Right? That's the ultimate rebuke, because the ultimate rebuke in the world to come, what we always think of rebuke is somebody getting in your face and pointing a finger at you. You know what rebuke is? Rebuke is when you say to your dad, uh, Dad, I, I haven't got the energy to mow the lawn. Right? Dad, they say, can you do me a favor, get mow the lawn? I, I, I just don't have the energy. And 10 minutes later, the phone rings, and your friends want you to get together for some midnight hockey. And, hey, Dad, can I go play midnight hockey? He says, no, you don't have energy, remember? You haven't got any energy. Uh, I wouldn't want. I wouldn't want. I wouldn't want. I wouldn't, mind, I wouldn't want you to have to exert yourself now. No, no. For this, I got energy. No, no. You know, no, I, my dad was a master of that. He was a master of trapping me in those sort of things. You know, he, he even set up situations to trap me when I'd say, oh, "No, you haven't got energy." So when it comes, to, so a guy comes up after 120 years. God says, uh, "Did you wear it filling?" Nah, not really. I wasn't into it filling. Why not? He says, "You know, that's pretty expensive. You know, thousand bucks for." For little black boxes, you know. That's why he says, oh, yeah? You had a little black, that's a little square black box you got over there in your pocket that you walk around with. That's a little square block box you paid about a 1000 That you could afford, that little square box that you could do all sorts of things on that you could afford. My boxes you couldn't afford? That's the rebuke. Oh, I didn't see you giving stuck. Well, you know, it's a lot of money to give away, you know. Oh, but you went to restaurants where you paid you paid forty five bucks for the entree and ninety bucks for a cup of wine over there that you can afford. But my stuff you couldn't afford. You see, the rebuke is only taking you and showing you who you are. That's why the ultimate rebuke is showing a person I, I, you're you're caught in a self contradiction. You're caught in a self contradiction. That's the worst thing. I'm not telling you to be more than you could have been. But you see that you could have done this. So also, what, well, that you can't do? For everybody else in the world, that's why husbands and wives, you know, go through this all the time, where, where, where your first loyalty is supposed to be to your spouse. And you, the first loyalty is to your spouse. And then your wife may say to you, how come you're nice to everybody else in the world and to me you're not? You know. Or, 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 or a husband says to his wife, how can you're always baking a cake for the neighbors where they make a kiddish for me and never make a special cake? You know, who's your first loyalty to? You know, I'm not telling you to bake a cake if you can't. But if you already got energy to bake a cake, bake it for me. So I say, you can bake me, nah, I haven't got it. Then the phone rings. Oh, by the way, the gold seeds are making a kiddish this Shabbos. There's a brisk. Do you think you can make it? And she's up and she's baking. You know, what, what happened over here? You know, the answer is, it, the, 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 ultimate, the ultimate rebuke is being caught in a self-contradiction. And that's what Yosef was saying to his brothers. You know, where, where, where was I? Where were you 22 years? All of a sudden you're singing a song and a dance over here. Where were you 22 years ago? One last idea. 
The last idea here is that, that um, um, if you look at the word in Hebrew, this is a remarkable idea. You look at the word in Hebrew here, it says, Vayomer Yosef Elechov, I'm reading the Pesach again. Ani Yosef, Orovichai, Velo Yochlu Echov Anososo Ki Nivhalu Mipanov. What does the word Mipanov really mean? Literally, what does Mipanov mean? Face. From his face. So, you know, one of the commentaries explains over why didn't they recognize him all along. He had some sort of Egyptian headgear on him. And uh, they weren't looking at him. They couldn't see his face clearly. And when he takes it off, all of a sudden they see his face. Oh, my goodness, it really is Yosef. Okay? Idea number one. Idea number two is one of the most enchanting words in the Hebrew language is the word face. Panim. What does panim literally mean? What does panim mean? Misrat panim. The minister of the interior. Why is your face, which is the most public part of you, the most, the most uh, 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 presented part of you, why is your face called your inside? And the answer is obviously because your face registers what's going on inside. Your emotions show on your face, your honesty, your greed, your enthusiasm. You, you, you could read a face. You could read a face. People read body language. You read body language. You could even read, you certainly read a face. The face is called the inside because it's all reflected on your face. You could tell when you got, they talk about keeping a poker face. The young guy's trying to trying to and his eyes are glowing. You know, you got, he, you know, he's holding a good hand over there. It's all everything your excitement shows on your face. If you're sad, it shows on your face. All the emotions show on a face. And the face is the representation of what's going on inside. Now listen to this, remarkable. Do you know there's a Pasuk that says, Chokmas Odon Ta'ir Ponov? A person whose wisdom causes his face to glow. Sometimes you look at people and say, well, that just looks like a wise man. That just looks like a, he just looks like a wise man. He just looks like a, a smart person. His, especially Torah, Ruchni, uh, uh, spiritual uh, 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 values, Kedusha, holiness, it shows on a person's face. Part of Yosef, Yosef is a tremendous tzaddik. So what would you have expected by Yosef? You expect Yosef to have a spiritual glow. Yosef's greatness was in keeping himself hidden. Yosef had to hide that greatness. A very deep idea here, gentlemen. Commentaries say, all along Yosef managed to, so to speak, turn off the spiritual luminance that comes from him. And when he revealed himself, he revealed himself in full righteousness. So you know what it's like? It's like turning a flashlight on in somebody's eyes. Because when Yosef says, Ani Yosef, and all of a sudden the spiritual glow comes out. And the brothers, they couldn't answer because they're intimidated by his face. You know what that means? What are they really? It's not just the light that's shining in their face. It's the brothers see Yosef for who he really is. That's, that's, uh, that's who we sold? Takes you back 22 years. That's who we sold? That Sadik is the one we sold. That's how we, we, we were so blinded and thought that he deserves to be sold. And that's the, that's, there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than when you're confronted with, 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 with what you did wrong. That's the, what the commentary say. Now, on a plain meaning, on a plain level, let's take it down, down to the plainness level, is just, you know, you got, what could you possibly say to somebody who you sold 22 years ago? What could you possibly say? You know, hi, hi, it's me, Yosef. I knew a guy, I knew a guy who's a, a Russian guy whose father abandoned him and the mother when he was about two years old, something like that, one years old, two years old. The guy grew up, he was here at Orsamach, and he traced his father. His father was a doctor, and he traced him. He traced his father down, and finally one day he made an appointment, finally found where his father was. He didn't, he'd been spent a couple years looking, finally found his father, had a medical practice somewhere in Israel. And one day he made an appointment, he made an appointment to go see the doctor. And he comes in, he comes walking into the office, and he walks in, he sits and says, yeah, what's the problem? He says, hi, Dad. And then he said, there was about 15 or 20 minutes of silence. He did, what, what can you possibly say? <laughs> what, what can you possibly say? Oh, uh, hi, son, how, how are things? <laughs> You know, what can you possibly say? He had abandoned for 20 years. And the guy, he told me they just sat there looking, for, looking at each other for about 15, 20 minutes, staring at each other. So, and you know, what can you say? Oh, hi, fellas. It's me. You remember you sold me 22 years ago? 
What can you possibly what can you possibly say? Okay? Now, one last point. I said that already, but I'll say another one. And we'll, we'll elaborate on this tomorrow. It says, Ani Yosef Odovichai. So the Chafetz Chaim says, Can you imagine how many questions the brothers had was going through their mind at this point? Imagine their confusion. What's this guy doing? He's sending us back. What's the blood? The, 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 there's a frame up over here. Yosef says two words, and the whole, and the whole thing is clear. What does Yosef say? I'm Yosef. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh. Here we go to those movies. You know, they have those movies like, they, they say, they, and then all of a sudden, in the last scene of the movie, everything falls into place. Like a book. And so I say, you're just like, like who is he? Was it? Oh, 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 you, oh, and the whole thing untwists with, with one scene, the whole thing untwists. There's always somebody at the end of the movie, I, you know, there's somebody in a parking lot afterwards, you ever see these guys standing back, he says, oh, you mean he was a good guy all along? Oh, I thought he was with the bag. No, he was a good guy. He was a, I was always the guy somebody was explaining it to. <laughs> there's always one guy who gets it right from the, from the get-go, you know, the guy said, oh, he's going to get killed, he's a bad guy, he's going to be, he's a double agent, you know, he, he knows the whole thing, and I, and I still haven't got it by the end of the movie, I'm still in absolute, uh, then he's sitting there in the parking lot and explaining to me, no, don't you understand, the reason he killed him was because he was a bad guy. Oh, uh, that was me. I had no a clueless, always clueless. Always had, and one friend, one friend who, who got it from the beginning. I was like, yeah, no, it's got the whole thing worked out. I need Yosef. Uh, oh, you mean, oh. Uh, so the Chafetz Chaim says, if that's how they felt when Yosef revealed himself, look at all the questions we have in life. Why this? Why that happened? Why isn't it happening? And all, in ultimate revelation, God's going, it's me, Hashem. Oh, and all of the understanding, because it's going to come sweeping in, all of the questions are going to be washed away. And then there's going to be a thing, oh, ah, one long, oh, now I get it. Okay, we'll stop here, gentlemen. We'll continue. Tomorrow.